Welcome to this presentation on dissolution and solubilizing agents. This presentation is part of the Pharmaceutics 1 course in the professional curriculum at the College of Pharmacy of Washington State University. This presentation will guide you through the fundamentals on dissolution of solid dosage forms. It will also describe strategies for modifying the dissolution behavior of solid dosage forms with and without the use of excipients. This presentation is divided into two parts. In the first part, we will explore the idea of dissolution and explain the difference between solubility and dissolution rate. We will then introduce the noise Whitley model as a quantitative method for describing the time dependence of dissolution. Finally, we will use the noise Whitley model to predict some of the pharmaceutical and clinical approaches that one can use to modify the solution of solid dosage forms. In the second part of this presentation, we will discuss the use of excipients known as solubilizing agents and how they could be used to modify the dissolution of solid dosage forms. We will first describe some of the clinical needs for dosage forms of a given drug with significantly different dissolution characteristics. We would then describe some of the mechanisms by which excipients can be used to modify dissolution. And finally, we will explore one solubilizing agent in particular, cyclodextrin, and talk about some of the therapeutic and pharmaceutical benefits of using it as a drug carrier. At a fundamental level, it is important for us to differentiate between solubility and dissolution rate. These two concepts represent two different aspects of the solution. Specifically, solubility, which is what we have focused primarily on in previous lectures, is a thermodynamic concept. It refers to the tendency of a solid to dissolve at equilibrium, and time is not explicitly considered. The solution rate, on the other hand, is a kinetic concept and explicitly considers the time dependence of how the solution is occurring. What is particularly important is to recognize that behavior in one aspect does not imply analogous behavior in the other. So that, for example, highly soluble substances may dissolve very rapidly or quite slowly under specified conditions, and vice versa. In biopharmaceutics, both solubility and dissolution rates are important ideas. However, dissolution rate, which is kinetics, are generally more relevant. Recall what we have discussed previously on the fallacy of the pH partition hypothesis, and that often very sparingly soluble drugs are quite well absorbed. In order to understand how the solution occurs as a function of time, and more importantly, to be able to make predictions on how we can modify the solution of solid dosage forms, we need a model. In 1897, two chemists at MIT, Arthur Noyes and Willis Whitney, proposed what is today known as the Noyes-Whitney model. In their model, the basing medium surrounding solid particles is divided into two regions. The first region, which makes up the bulk of the basing medium, is known as the bulk fluid. The bulk fluid is a kind of homogeneous component from which the substance of interest will migrate from the solid surface and becomes a solute. And it is the time dependence of solid concentration in the bulk fluid that we will be primarily interested in. The second region is a layer of constant thickness surrounding each solid particle. In contrast to the bulk fluid, the concentration in the diffusion layer is not changing with respect to time and is therefore sometimes called a stagnant layer. 
Because the noise whitney model is a relatively simple mathematical model, it can only describe the solution under what is known as steady state conditions, which means that it assumes that the concentration at the surface of the particle is not changing with respect to time. For this reason, the noise whitney model cannot describe what happens when a, when a particle first encounters a solvent or when a particle completely dissolves into the solvent. By dividing the basing medium into two different regions, Noyce and Whitney has modeled dissolution as the movement or flux of a substance, in this case a drug, across the diffusion layer into the bulk fluid. And our goal is to come up with a way to quantitatively describe this flux from the particle surface into the bulk fluid. Flux, which is the time dependence of physical movement, is basically the number of molecules, or using Avogadro's number, the number of moles that are moving per unit time. In some cases, we can also take into account per unit surface area. But in this case, we will make area explicit, and flux will simply be the number of molecules or mole per unit time. The advantage of describing the solution using the noise whitney model is that we can apply a result from classical physics, known as Fick's first law, to describe what happens. Here's a close-up cartoon of the noise whitney model. Here we have the solid particle on the left, separated from the bulk fluid by a diffusion layer of constant thickness h. For convenience, we will assign spatial coordinates to the diffusion layer using x as the variable. Diffusion, of course, occurs from left to right, where x is equal to 0 to x is equal to h, the thickness of the diffusion layer. This creates a concentration gradient where the solute concentration or drug concentration is highest at x is equal to zero, where the particle surface meets the diffusion layer, and its lowest at x is equal to h, where the diffusion layer meets the bulk fluid. Under these conditions, Fick's first law tells us that the flux of matter across the diffusion layer symbolized by the letter J, is proportional to the concentration gradient, dc dx. The constant of proportionality is described here as a product of two terms. The first, d, or the diffusion constant, is the characteristic of the drug that makes up the solid particle. The second factor, A, is the total surface area of the solid particles. Because D and A are positive numbers, Fick's first law is written with a negative sign to denote the fact that diffusion occurs from where the concentration is highest to where the concentration is lowest. Since we have defined the diffusion layer, we can expand this derivative dc dx. At the top, dc, this is simply the concentration at the end of the diffusion layer at x is equal to h minus the concentration at the beginning where x is equal to zero. The x is simply the constant h. As stated, Fick's first law is not a particularly good description of the noise whitney model for two reasons. First, we do not know, nor have a way of directly measuring, the concentration of the drug on the particle's surface. Therefore, we assume that the particle's side of the diffusion layer is saturated with drug, or that the concentration at x is equal to zero is equal 
to a constant known solubility of the drug S. Second, Fick's first law doesn't tell us directly what the concentration of the drug in the bulk fluid is, which is what we are actually interested in. So here, we assume that the bulk fluid of some constant volume V equilibrates instantaneously with the diffusion layer at x is equal to h, or that the concentration in the bulk is equal to the concentration at x is equal to h for all time t. With these two assumptions, we can now rewrite Fick's first law and obtain what is known as the noise whitney equation shown here. Here, now we can equate the flux of particles across the diffusion layer with the rate of appearance of drug molecules in the bulk fluid by dividing J by the constant volume V. Notice that in the noise whitney equation, the diffusion coefficient, the total surface area, the volume of the bulk fluid, the thickness of the diffusion layer, and the solubility of the drug are all constants. So that the rate of appearance of drug molecules in the bulk fluid is a function in only a single variable. And this variable is the concentration of drug molecule in the bulk fluid raised to the first power. So the noise whitney equation then predicts that the appearance of drug molecule in the bulk fluid would follow first order kinetics, as we will see in a moment. If we make an additional assumption, known as the sink condition, meaning that the bulk fluid is either extremely vast, or that the drug is rapidly removed from the, drug, the bulk fluid, such that the concentration there is zero for all time t. Then the rate of appearance of drug in the bulk fluid becomes only a constant, or that this rate will become zeroth order. Let us now look at a couple of examples and see how the noise whitney equation can model the dissolution kinetics of solid substances. Here we have the original publication by Noyce and Whitney from 1897, and you can see their version of the Noyce Whitney equation here, in which they have collected the various constants from the previous slide into a single constant, capital C. In their study, Noyce and Whitney measured the dissolution of two solids, lead chloride and benzoic acid, in water by measuring the concentration of these two substances as a function of time. Because the noise whitney equation gives you the rate of the solution rather than the actual concentration itself, it is necessary to integrate the noise whitney equation to come up with a function that will tell you what the concentration is at any given time. This is shown here by integrating the noise whitney equation. This is not a trivial integration, but you can verify that this is in fact the correct result by substituting this function into x in the original noise whitney equation. If we look at this particular relation here, you will see that the noise whitney equation in fact does predict first order kinetics in that this is an exponential function in time with capital C as what is hopefully the familiar rate constant that is sometimes denoted by small letter k but it's denoted by capital C here to be consistent with noise whitney notation. If we plot the concentration 
as a function of time. You will see that if you wait sufficiently long, the noise Whitney model predicts that the concentration in the bulk fluid will eventually become the concentration of the drug on the particle surface. It will of course not be able to be above this level because the concentration gradient at this point no longer favors the movement of drug from the particle into the bulk fluid. We should also note that according to first order kinetics we expect to find a half time, the time at which the concentration in the bulk fluid is equal to half the concentration on the particle surface and this occurs at a time equal to ln of the number 2 over the rate constant, again as we expect from first order kinetics. Now that we understand how the noise whitney equation models the dissolution kinetics of solid dosage forms, we can use it to answer the more important question of how we can improve the dissolution characteristics of solid dosage forms. For the moment, we will assume that our goal is to increase the dissolution rate. In other words, to maximize the rate of appearance of drug molecules in the bulk fluid. Given the constants on the right side, it would appear that if you want to maximize the rate, you would want to increase the terms or factors in the numerator and minimize the factors in the denominator. In practice, it will turn out that not all of these factors are susceptible to modification. But we will see which ones we can in fact do something about. First, we will consider the diffusion code constant, D. Generally speaking, the diffusion constant is characteristic of the drug and solvent combination. There's unlikely very much we can do with respect to the drug itself, because we are fixed in what we would like to dissolve from the dosage form. However, the, we can modify the characteristic of the solvent in one important way. If we assume that the molecule making up the particles are spherical, we can use a, a result from classical physics known as the Stokes-Einstein relation to break down the diffusion constant into more fundamental factors, as shown here. In the early 20th century, Einstein discovered that the diffusion constant is related to another physical property known as the frictional constant, F. These two quantities are inversely related by the factor kT, where k is Boltzmann constant, for our purposes it's simply some positive number, and the absolute temperature, which is also a positive number. The frictional constant can be further broken down into even more fundamental quantities. In particular, it depends on eta, the viscosity of the medium, and r, the size of the molecule. The quantity which is amenable to modification is going to be the viscosity eta. And from a drug administration point of view, the viscosity can be readily reduced by simply drinking lots and lots of water when you take the dosage form. In other words, if you thin out the basing medium by decreasing the viscosity, this will lead to an increase in diffusion constant, which will in turn increase the rate of appearance 
of dissolved drug in the bulk fluid. Another strategy we can use is to increase the solubility of the drug. In other words, increase the value of S. One way to do this is, in the case of ionizable drug, to use the most highly soluble form of that drug. Generally, this will be the charged form for an acid, this will be the conjugate base, and for a basic drug, this will be the conjugate acid. Another way to increase solubility is to ensure that the particle surface is at a pH which promotes ionization maximally. And one way to promote this is to use an excipient or coating on the particle that will buffer the pH of the diffusion layer so that the drug remains in as, as to the extent possible an ionized state which is more soluble in water. A third strategy is to increase the total surface area of the solid particles, in other words, to maximize the value of A. This can be done easily by reducing the particle sizes of the individual particles and therefore increasing the sum of the surface areas for all of the particles. This strategy works for all drugs regardless of their ionizability and it's particularly important for hydrophobic compounds for which solubility in water may be extremely limited. Here are several examples of highly hydrophobic compounds for which the solution from solid dosage forms can be greatly improved by reducing their particle size and thereby increasing the total surface area. So the first example is an antifungal agent called griseofulvin. And micronized powders of griseofulvin is in fact required for this drug to be orally bioavailable. A second drug which is highly micronized for oral administration is phenofibrate and the structure is shown here. Like griseofulvin, phenofibrate is also a highly hydrophobic drug and non-micronized version of phenofibrate has very much reduced oral bioavailability relative to these micronized versions. A third example is hydrocortisone, which is shown here. Hydrocortisone, as you know, is a steroid compound and is therefore very hydrophobic. In the case of hydrocortisone, this is a common ingredient for a lot of dermatological compounds that you might make at the pharmacy. Micronized powders of hydrocortisone is typically used to promote their dissolution out of compounded creams and other semi-solids which contain substantial amounts of water. One important consideration in using particle size reduction as a strategy to increase total surface area and therefore increase the rate of dissolution of solid dosage forms is to appreciate surface effects which we have previously discussed. In other words, do all attempts at increasing surface area always lead to a corresponding increase in dissolution rate? The noise whitney equation, of course, predicts that this will always be true. However, as powders become finer and finer, 
surface effects will ultimately begin to dominate. Consider, for example, a powder which has been comminuted so much that surface tension of, from the solvent simply causes it to float on top of it. And therefore, the surface area that is in contact with solvent may in fact only be very small. In the case of tablets, a common strategy to increase surface area is to drill very small holes into it. However, in this case, surface tension may again prevent solvent from actually penetrating these openings. In both cases, the effect is that the effective surface area may be actually very much smaller than the total physically available area of the solid. This points to the importance of actually wetting the surface which are solvent accessible in order for dissolution to occur. And excipients such as surfactants are very helpful in this respect. We will discuss surfactants some more at a later slide. Now that we have studied the basics of dissolution as a physical phenomenon, in the second part of the presentation, we will focus on more specific approaches that are used to modify the dissolution of solid or dosage forms. We will begin with a brief introduction of the biopharmaceutics of oral drug administration. It is generally the case that all non-solution dosage forms, including suspensions, capsules, and tablets, involve some type of dissolution phase prior to being absorbed because only dissolved drug can be absorbed. If dissolution is slower than transport across the membranes, then we say that absorption is dissolution rate limited. Conversely, if transport across membranes is slower than dissolution, then we say that absorption is transport rate limited. With this in mind, any modification of the solubility or dissolution rate of a dosage form ultimately depends on what the intended therapeutic indication is, even for the same drug. Let's look at an example. Narcotic analgesics, such as oxycodone, are commonly required by palliative patients for the purpose of pain control. For this application, two different dosage forms of the same narcotic are required. One, an immediate release dosage form, is needed to treat acute pain by releasing the narcotic as rapidly as possible. This process is sometimes known as dose dumping. In addition to the immediate release dosage form, a sustained release dosage form is also required to maintain baseline analgesia. The sustained release dosage form is designed not to release all of the narcotic as quickly as possible, but rather release them more slowly and at a defined rate. Therefore, it is not unusual, in fact, therapeutically required, to have to prescribe for palliative pain control both forms of the same narcotic. For, pro for prolonged release dosage forms, there are often all very different goals that are to be achieved. For example, in the case of oxycodone for pain control, the goal is to release the narcotic at a continuous slow rate. This is known as sustained release. However, for other types of drugs, it may be desirable to have pulsatile release, meaning that the drug is released in large bursts at defined intervals rather than continuously over a prolonged time period. 
At this point, it is useful to review some of the physical aspects on the solution rate which we have covered in this presentation. First, let's remind ourselves that for a solid dosage form, the solution can only occur on water accessible surfaces, meaning that solids in the interior of the particles are not accessible to the solvent and therefore do not undergo dissolution. The therefore, the rate of dissolution should be highly surface area dependent, as we have seen from our examination of the noise Whitney model. The total surface area of solid particles can is a function of particle size, as we have seen, but also of morphology. In other words, particles of occupying the same volume can have very different amounts of total surface area depending on their shape. In general, spherical particles will have the lowest amount of total surface area. In addition to the physical characteristics of the particles, the intrinsic characteristic of the drug itself, as well as the solid, are important. We have studied these characteristics in a previous lecture on solids. To review, we remind ourselves that there are significant differences in solubility between crystalline forms versus amorphous forms of the same drug. There are also significant differences between ionic versus molecular crystals of the same drug in cases where this is possible, in other words, for ionizable drugs. In addition, solids of the same substance can have any number of polymorphic as well as pseudopolymorphic states under any given set of conditions. Finally, it is possible to modify the dissolution characteristics of solid dosage forms using excipients, and this is where we will focus the remainder of this presentation on. We will see that there are a number of different excipients that can be used for this purpose including what are called disintegrants used to forcibly increase the total surface area once the solid dosage form comes into contact with water. There are surfactants which aid in wetting solid surfaces. And finally, there are a specific class of compounds known as cyclodextrins which can serve as drug carriers for hydrophobic compounds. A common group of excipients in solid dosage forms are polymers of carbohydrate, more specifically starch and cellulose derivatives. These types of substances have the characteristic of swelling when they come into contact with water because of their abundance of hydroxyl groups which hydrogen bond well with water molecules. As they swell, they help break up the tablet or capsules of which they form a part. More advanced types of carbohydrates, such as sodium starch glycolate or cross camelos, are sometimes called super disintegrants because these synthetic carbohydrates are able to increase the volume under hydration at a level much greater than the natural carbohydrate derivatives such as starch, as you see here in this diagram. The dry tablets are shown here, and the hydrated disintegrated tablet is shown here.
And as you can see, the volume occupied by these powders far exceed the volume occupied by this single compressed tablet. In addition to disintegrants, surfactants are also common excipients in oral, in oral solid dosage forms. We have already discussed the importance of surfactants and wetting of solid surfaces to begin the process of the solution previously. Common surfactants that are used include sodium dodaxyl sulfate or SDS and magnesium stearate. Both of these compounds contain a hydrophobic component as well as a polar or charged group which interacts with water. By having both of these groups, surfactant can effectively introduce water into tight spaces within solid dosage forms and thereby efficiently wet their surfaces. Cyclodextrins are a class of excipients that are used to increase the bioavailability of highly hydrophobic compounds. As their name suggests, cyclodextrins are cyclic chains consisting of glucose molecules in their six-membered ring form, or glucopyranose. Each of these glucopyranose is connected head to tail from one another at the one and four positions. The number of glucopyranose per cyclodextrin defines the type of cyclodextrin molecules. Specifically, we use the designation alpha, beta, gamma, and delta to refer to cyclodextrins that are composed of six seven, eight, or nine units of leucopyranose. The particular conformation of cyclodextrin in aqueous media produces a specific structure where the hydroxyls of the sugar molecules are all pointing outwards into the aqueous solvent and produces an internal cavity that is highly hydrophobic. This cavity can host or take in a hydrophobic molecule and shield it from the aqueous environment. We can take advantage of the hydrophobic cavities of cyclodextrins and use them as an effective carriers for highly hydrophobic drugs. In aqueous medium, hydrophobic molecules will reversibly enter the hydrophobic cavity of cyclodextrins in order to reduce the exposure to water molecules, forming what are called inclusion or host guest complexes. The resulting complex has a solubility that is generally much higher than the solubility of the hydrophobic guest. This then leads to an apparent increase in the solubility of the drug. It is important to note that the hydrophobic cavity found in each of the four types of common cyclodextrins have a defined dimension and this dimension will limit the size of guests that are able to enter this cavity. As a drug carrier, cyclodextrins have an important advantage in that it can interact directly with biological membranes and in fact extract lipids from them. This particular behavior allows cyclodextrin to directly deliver the drugs 
that are within their cavities directly to the GI membrane. Another important advantage of cyclodextrin as a drug carrier is that they have the potential of increasing drug stability by sequestering the drug from aqueous solution. Therefore, if a degradation pathway for the guest is by hydrolysis or some other water-based chemistry, being in a cyclodextrin complex will allow the drug to become more stable than it would otherwise be if it is surrounded by water molecules. On this slide, we see some specific examples of how cyclodextrin, abbreviated CD here, can improve the solubility of highly hydrophobic compounds in an aqueous environment. If we look at the top table, we can see that the use of beta cyclodextrin, which has a cavity dimension that is ideal for steroidal compounds, can improve the apparent aqueous solubility of steroidal compounds such as dexamethasone, digoxin, testosterone, and so forth, anywhere from hundreds to tens of thousands of times, which is very significant. In addition to enhancing bioavailability and improving stability in solution, cyclodextrins also offer a number of other potential advantages, all of which relate to the sequestering of hydrophobic gas, which are often volatile and reactive from aqueous environment. In fact, you may be familiar with the household product Febreze, whose active ingredient is beta-cyclodextrin, and it removes unpleasant odors by literally hiding the offending molecules within the hydrophobic cavity. In conclusion, I hope that this presentation has provided a useful overview of the solution of solid dosage forms as well as the various strategies that may be used to modify the solution behavior.